Welcome, everyone. I'm delighted to announce the latest in our Brexit series talks. My name is Kaya Shilda. I'm a professor at the BU Party School for Global Studies. I'm the acting director this year for the Center for the Study of Europe. And this, this event today is part of a series, the third in a series of five events, which explores different facets of Brexit and the future of the United Kingdom. In addition to the Center for the Study of Europe, this series is also co-sponsored by the Evergreen Lifelong Learning Program at BU's Metropolitan College. And I'm delighted to announce today's talk is by Scott Lucas titled, On the Whole, I'd Rather Be in Dublin, the US-UK Relationship After Brexit. I love the title, but let me introduce Scott briefly. Uh, he is a professor emeritus of American studies at University of Birmingham and an associate of the Clinton Institute at University College Dublin. He's a specialist in US and British foreign policy, and he also researches many aspects. We were just discussing it earlier of current international affairs, especially North Africa, Middle East, and Iran, new media and intelligence services. He's also the founder and editor of EA Worldview, one of the leading news and analysis sites on US foreign policy and international affairs, especially in the Middle East, and a frequent contributor to American, British, and international media. Scott Lucas, welcome. Thank you all so much for having me here. It'll be a broad brush, folks, so I very much would like your input to try to fill in the lines um, on what we're talking about. But let me start today um, probably by tipping off uh, my overall approach to this with the, the three most important words I will utter, uh, which are go Red Sox. Um, that I think is the thing to be keeping in mind in these days of October as our priority. But beyond that, let me also thank uh, Professor Shilda, uh, my former colleague, uh, uh, a guy who taught me an awful lot in a galaxy far, far away here in Birmingham uh, a few years ago, uh, Professor Goldstein. Let me thank all of you uh, at Boston University and the Evergreen Initiative for, for having me in here to chat. Uh, I say that because I spent perhaps some of the happiest <laughs> time of my life, 18 months in Boston. I was at an institution across the river in Cambridge, uh, not quite as good an institution as Boston. You, of course, you all know that. Uh, but while I was there, I did become a Red Sox convert and also just simply uh, well, have this attachment to the area, which means that even virtually, it's great to be back in Boston uh, for what is actually a surprisingly blue sky afternoon here in Birmingham, as well as I hope, uh, hope for you. Um, let me speak a little bit, however, today, not about Boston, but about uh, the area where I've lived for most of my life since 1984, which is the United Kingdom, or as my parents think of it, England. They don't actually know Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland exist, which is a cultural aspect, I think, that affects US-UK relations we can talk about. And let me talk, start with the initial focus on the US-UK relationship at, amid Brexit. I'm happy to go wider and to intersect with the excellent talks you've had in the past two weeks. Um, I'm happy to talk about uh, the economic consequences of Brexit, to talk about the political consequences, including the status of the union, which you heard about with reference to Scotland last week. But we'll also be happy to talk about the Northern Ireland situation, which is our current hot button topic right now, both here and in the Irish Republic. Um, and also just simply how I think culturally, uh, what's happening with English political culture uh, and why that's at the heart of Brexit. But for the US-UK relationship, let me start with area one with the general observation, which uh, has really preoccupied me for the last few years, and that is ripping up the rule book. Um, and by the way, as I go through this, I will signpost, but I prefer talking to you like this conversationally. So I won't be using slides, but there will be an outline which is in, should be visible to everyone in the comment section where you can follow along. Under ripping up the rule book, what I mean is, is that I was trained and you know, working with colleagues like Professor Goldstein, we worked on, for example, the assumption of rationality and interest. I remember all the way back in undergraduate years, the rational actor model. And if anything, the last few years, I pretty much had to tr throw the rational actor model to the side in the sense of how decisions are constructed, looking at cost benefit, trying to evaluate this economically, politically, and socially. Um, there's been a lot of behavior which is not necessarily rational 
or behavior which may be driven by ego rather than for the wider benefit of a community, let alone a nation. The assumption of nation state behavior as being at the core of what we look at internationally, I think is under great scrutiny. I say that in two ways. I think first of all, that a lot of the interactions that take place today, a lot of the transnational interactions are not necessarily driven by nation states. They may be influenced by them, but they're not driven by them. And I also say that to the extent that there are elements beyond the nation state, the EU is one of them, where we have to evaluate what type of model we're working with. When you're talking about, for example, 27, used to be 28, and now 27 nation states that are in that block. So both from the ground up, and then beyond the nation state, whether we're talking about businesses, whether we're talking about NGOs, whether we're talking about the health sector, whether we're talking about broadcasting and media, we have more of a kaleidoscope of what is happening through quite often negotiation, sometimes co-optation, sometimes coercion. And I think this question of accounting for the emotive. Now, I'm fortunate, have been fortunate at Birmingham, uh, where I was until recently, to work with political psychologists who are beginning to bring this in the way that emotive behavior underpins a lot of the decisions that are made, that it is that emotive that we try to quantify, or not quantify, you can't quantify it. You try to assess it, you try to understand it and assess it, whether it's the emotive of the individual, the emotive of a group, the emotive of groups who are interacting with each other. Sometimes we used to group this under, you know, labels like nationalism, for example. But what, for example, is an English nationalism, not a British nationalism? and English nationalism. How do we assess the emotive of that in the 21st century? All of that ripping up the rule book or at least changing the rules have been highlighted by Brexit. Brexit is not, in my opinion, a rational policy. I can explain to you the rationalizations that have been put out for it. The rationalizations around immigration, the rationalizations around bureaucracy, the rationalizations around sovereignty. But in terms of a rational approach to cost benefit, Brexit doesn't fit. I can also talk to you about how nation state behavior is not sufficient to identify what happened with Brexit. That what happened in terms of a community or what we think a community was, was at the heart of what Britain wandered into. And in many senses, it did wander into it just before 2016. And then there are these five turbulent years which have ensued. And of course, I think the emotive the emotive is at the heart of trying to understand Brexit. Now, all of that is not specifically on the US-UK relationship, but it influences me as I add, perhaps now area two, which is okay, let me rework the rule book by talking about alliance and structures. Um, having just highlighted the emotive, I have never believed that there is an emotive special relationship. Um, if you want, the special relationship is a convenient myth. Um, when I was growing up in Alabama, in the Southeast, my parents knew two things about England, not the United Kingdom, England. They knew about the queen and they knew about a comedian who most people probably don't remember now, but he happened to be on television <laughs> called Benny Hill. Uh, not a very good comedian, but they liked him. And that was all they knew. And indeed, all through the period when I did my graduate work in London, uh, actually my year abroad in Leeds, then my graduate work in London, and then my first job in Birmingham, well into the 1990s, they knew very little about England. They wouldn't even visit the country because they thought it was a, a decaying country, something where 30 years later, I might have a point of contact with them, given what we're going through. But for them, there wasn't a special relationship. There wasn't a bond. They were in Alabama. And I think that's true for many Americans. So as much as we talk about how as academics that you know, they have constructed and academics as well as policymakers have talked about the bonds of language, the bonds of law. Now, you cannot walk into a situation and assume an alliance based on some type of primordial tie, even one which is constructed and mythologized by Winston Churchill in 1946 as one of the Anglo-Saxon peoples. Rather for me, the special relationship is a relationship based on structures and links. Again, very influential when I was trying to learn what was going on in the world. When I had relocated from the US to the UK and was doing my doctoral work, in particular on the Suez crisis, was Richard Neustadt's approach to alliance politics. And Neustadt, in that book, which is now, I think, 50 years old, 
talked about how the special relationship was driven not by the emotive, was not driven by the cultural, was not driven by an a priori alliance. It was an alliance which was built upon structures, organizations, bureaucracies. Certainly there were catalysts for that. World War II would be the key one. But this is something where you have interest which come out of those structures and out of those links. Or rather those structures and those links interact with those interests as the best way to fulfill them. And you and I can talk through this and if you want to in Q&A, going political, military, economic, and indeed cultural institutions. So not the emotive of culture, but cultural institutions that have projected the US and the UK to each other and where those have salience. And then there's the Janet Jackson rule. This is not in any academic work, kind of a long way down from Richard Neustadt to Janet Jackson, but what have you done for me lately? I won't try to sing it for you, but I'll just express it, which is that as much as we try to think about a special relationship or mythologize it, or even talk about alliance in long durée terms, we're now talking about what, 75 years after the end of World War II, very much alliance turns upon what is the immediate interest, what is the immediate crisis, what should be done. And I think you could probably think of examples very, very quickly, such as, for example, the response after 9-11, to the question of whether the United Kingdom would go to war with the United States in Iraq in 2003. Area three, my starting point, and I will put, you know, I don't believe in Heidi, I don't, you know, I'm an analyst, but I don't believe all, any analyst is objective. So I will tell you my assessment straight off in area three, that the starting point of this is, is the damage to the UK position from Brexit. The damage to the UK position from Brexit, which will intersect with ideas of alliance and of interest and of structure is A, this is a self-imposed isolation from Europe and the European Union. Indeed, I think this may be one of the great acts of self-inflicted damage in modern history. Maybe not as <laughs> damaging as say Nazi Germany's decision to attack the Soviet Union in 1941. Uh, maybe not as great as the Cultural Revolution and what it inflicted within China in the 1960s, but it is self-inflicted damage. There was no reason, no reason, in my opinion, for the pursuit of Brexit. Rather, it was an emotive iso distancing, I should say, distancing from Europe and the European Union. I say that it was a self-imposed isolation, which was a motive because B, if I was to look at power and the question of the UK's power, I begin with the economic effect. Um, in the run-up to the 2016 referendum, because I happen to do a lot of television and radio work as, as part of my daily activity. And I can remember doing interview after interview, in particular with British outlets, where I would say, you need to, you know, if you support Brexit, all well and good, but you need to be upfront about the fact that almost all economists will make the estimate that with a complete break with the EU, what we would later call a no-deal Brexit, you were talking about a projection that over the next 10 to 15 years, we would have a relative decline in GDP of 8 to 10 percent. And that even with a managed Brexit, what you might call the, the agreement which was developed under the May government and which is now being unraveled by the Johnson government, you're talking about a four to 5% relative uh, decline in GDP. Again, the estimate was over 10 to 15 years, but it could be quicker given certain conditions. And I need to say, you need to be honest about this. This is an economic shock. And indeed that almost all economists said that in the year after Brexit was implemented, and this was before COVID of course, even before accounting for COVID, but that the economic effect of Brexit would be to put Britain close to a recession and possibly into a recession. How long it would last, there was debate about that, but there was that economic effect. And those economic assessments, and I'm happy to go through them with you, were pretty consistent. There were a couple of outliers, uh, such as the Thatcher economist, Patrick, uh, Patrick Menford, but they were outliers. And this was irrespective of political affiliation, cross board from right to left. That was the economic assessment. And every time I would go, many times I'd go on to this because I would go on certain outlets that were promoting Brexit. 
it would be thrown back at me, which was, you're just putting forth project fear. Project fear. Go back and look in 2016 and see how often those quotes were put up in the British media. And I finally would come back in the snappy soundbite way. So now I'm actually talking about project reality. The project fear and the idea that all the assessment of economic effect, all the assessment of the effect of power was actually being whipped up, was actually being, uh, was artificial or created. It was encapsulated by a man named Michael Gove. And Michael Gove, uh, one of the prominent Brexiteers, um, would, off the back of that, work at, had held government uh, cabinet posts, would come back into other government posts, uh, eventually becoming Minister of State without portfolio, but was supposed to handle the Brexit negotiations under Boris Johnson. The great irony is he's been demoted. He's now housing minister and has been replaced in the Brexit negotiations by someone who's far harder, uh, much more hard line on Brexit, Lord Frost. But at the time in 2016, Michael Gove addressed those economic concerns by saying, you cannot trust experts, point blank. That's a paraphrase, but it's pretty close to what he said. You cannot trust experts. So all that assessment of power, economic, political, and social swept away by the proponents of the Brexit movement. C, the damage to structure. And the damage to structure is, is that these links that I've referred to before, you know, the, the building blocks, as it were, of alliance, we're going to suffer a shock as well. Not necessarily on the US-UK side. We can talk about the Five Eyes intelligence system. We could talk about links, for example, which have been highlighted by the Australia-UK-US agreement for uh, nuclear submarines in recent weeks, even as that has damaged or at least risked damage to an alliance with European countries such as France. We could talk all about all of that, but I'm not talking more about the UK relationship with the EU. And this was raised, for example, by um, uh, Labour MPs like Yvette Cooper, who sat on the Parliament uh, Security Committee, who would say, look, what are you going to be your ties? What are you going to be the links that you're going to maintain with European security and intelligence structures post-Brexit, she never got a decent answer in Parliament in the years that Brexit was discussed. And indeed, this was never worked out in the Brexit withdrawal agreement. And we still have a very uncertain relationship in some aspects, whether you're talking about policing, whether you're talking about border control, which intersects with the uh, issue of immigration, or whether you talk about mutual defense, because those relations were not settled through Brexit. We still have NATO, which is very important, that covers some of that shock, but the working procedures, the bedrock of alliance and the links that were established were shaken on the security and intelligence front by the way that Brexit was implemented. And of course, if you're talking about a specific case where economics and security intersect, the absolute fiasco over the way that the question of the Irish border, the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland has been handled, and specifically a fiasco, which again is primarily the fault of the UK government, and which has been highlighted just in the past week, that's where it intersects. That there is a risk to fundamental security relationships and indeed the security of the Irish Republic because of the way the Brexit agreement has been implemented and then the way that its implementation has unraveled. Uh, even in the well, close to now almost two years that it's been in effect. The D, and then as we heard last week, but I'll just reiterate it, the, the damage to the, or the potential damage to the union. And again, since you probably, you know, since you heard that excellent presentation on Scotland last week, we can talk about Scottish independence. Um, I personally do think that it's not a guarantee that Scotland will be independence, but it's far more likely now that Scotland will be independent because of Brexit. I think you cannot count on the 2014 referendum being replicated in terms of its outcome. But I think even more immediate for me right now, again, as these things all interconnect, economics, security, and the union is the status of Northern Ireland. And that while I don't think we are talking about the question of Northern Ireland seceding from the United Kingdom, because where would it go? Unionists don't want to join the Republic of Ireland even though they have no love lost for London uh, at this point, uh, Ireland, the Republic, is not going to press for a united Ireland uh, across the island. 
I do think the uncertain status of Northern Ireland right now, at least as it is generated by London, where Northern Ireland is politically part of the United Kingdom, but is economically part of the European single market, um, we are in for unstable times until London can finally agree to a compromise with the European Union, if it can agree to such a compromise. Area four, analysis, doubling down on damage. Uh, the Johnson government's tactics on the economy have made a bad situation far worse. And I will start with two observations, which we can expand in question and answer uh, in whichever detail area that you want to go to go with. The first is, is that on the question of the customs line between Northern Ireland and Great Britain, which of course was at the heart of the compromise made to avoid a hard border on the Irish island, a hard border between the Republic and the North. Boris Johnson specifically, the prime minister, and I know we're not supposed to use this word in uh, British or English political culture, but I will use it. And I don't mind if you repeat it because I don't observe Chatham House rules here. Boris Johnson has continuously lied about that provision. And if you don't believe me, uh, I would ask you to go back to one of his appearances, which was in Northern Ireland before the 2019 general election, where to his credit, to the credit of the conservatives, they ran a very successful campaign and increased their majority substantially. But in the course of that appearance in Northern Ireland, and indeed in statements throughout the campaign, Boris Johnson said there was no customs line between Northern Ireland and Great Britain. He wished it away. But Boris Johnson not, Boris Johnson's not the sharpest tool in the box in terms of analysis. Uh, he's more of a cheerleader rather than uh, uh, someone who works off the basis of information and comprehension. But he is still sharp enough to know that there indeed was a customs line in the agreement. Uh, but he wanted for the sake of the campaign to pretend that it wasn't there. In fact, it wasn't just pretend it wasn't there. He was to wish it away because then, and apologies, I got my date slightly confused earlier. Of course, the Brexit agreement has only come into force at the end of 2020. Um, in September 2020, uh, so three months, two and a half months before the agreement was supposed to come in, the Northern Irish Secretary, Brendan Lewis, um, announced to the Parliament that the United Kingdom uh, was going to pursue uh, a process which would sweep away that provision of the Brexit withdrawal bill, uh, Brexit withdra uh, withdrawal agreement, Brexit agreement through something which was called the Internal Standards Bill. So they were going to try to bring Northern Ireland back into the UK economically and remove the customs line. Uh, even though, as Lewis admitted to Parliament, this was, quote, in his words, a limited, a limited violation of international law. The UK was going to break international law by, in effect, walking away from what is now known as the Northern Irish Protocol, what is known as the Northern Irish Protocol in the agreement. The government stepped back. The bill did not pass Parliament. It wasn't pushed through. But yet again, that was another signal that they did not believe they wanted to observe the protocol in practice. And indeed, the absolute failure of the UK to put in suitable customs and trade arrangements between Northern Ireland and Great Britain is telling because when the agreement came into effect in January, almost immediately, we had chaos and we have continued to have chaos in movement of trade and goods across the Irish Sea where we have had shortages of goods, for example, goods that move from Great Britain to Northern Ireland. Uh, this has been encapsulated by uh, the Brexiteers and Johnson and the idea that this has been inflicted by the EU under so in sausage wars because you can't get English sausage in Belfast. That is a myth which I can go through, but there was a very real effect beyond the politics that trade was affected. So in the past week, the Johnson government's tactics on Northern Ireland, I apologize, I've gone on a bit at length about this, but they have again threatened to walk out of the protocol altogether, even as the European Union has proposed a significant compromise, which lifts customs checks on the majority of goods 
from Great Britain going to Northern Ireland, a detailed compromise that was worked out by Mara Sefcovic, the chief uh, EU negotiator after weeks of meeting in both Northern Ireland and in the Republic. The second area of the Johnson government's tactics on the economy has simply been to deny the economic reality of what is occurring. Economic growth figures have dipped significantly since Brexit came into effect at the start of this year. Uh, the UK's overall exports to uh, the European Union have dropped by 16%. In certain cases, such as UK year exports to Germany, they've dropped by far more than that. In the case of uh, UK goods going to Ireland, there has been a massive drop. And indeed, even in the question of great British exports to Northern Ireland, there has been a significant drop, which to an extent, the Irish Republic has filled. Uh, the United Kingdom has lost already billions of pounds in trade because of the inflammation of the Brexit agreement. But of course, the Johnson government's tactics are twofold. First of all, to say that this is um, because of COVID, because of COVID-19. For example, a shortage of drivers, of truck drivers to move goods. Uh, for example, a shortage of people in the hospitality industry, in the tourist industry, in restaurants and pubs, because of the, the very severe restrictions now on European labor coming into the UK. Beyond the effect on the economy, we have got problems with labor shortages in the National Health Service, where there was a lot of European personnel before this year. But the Johnson government, again, will talk about the supply chain disruptions, those labor disruptions, as being, again, COVID. It's just COVID. It's nothing to do with Brexit, which is a falsehood. COVID has had an effect, but Brexit has had an effect, which will be here after COVID recedes. I'm going on a bit, so I will try to curb this. I will be able to expand on the economy just a bit, because you can tell I feel a bit passionate about it. Plus, I've got a column to write for the Center for Brexit Studies this week, uh, sorry, next week. And I could use any advice y'all can give me from the floor on where I go next with this. The tactics on Scotland, the Johnson government's tactics have not really been to address the Scottish people in terms of acknowledging the effect that Brexit may have had on Scotland's status, whether that be political or economic. The Johnson government's tactics are simply to say, you cannot have a referendum point blank. It is in our gift in Westminster, whether or not you get to vote again. And of course those tactics, although they may succeed in the specific legal sense, run the political risk that it will alienate Scots who say, wait a minute, why is it up to you in England? Why, if we get to choose whether or not we want to be independent, even if this referendum is being held only seven years after the one in 2014? Because as you heard last week, the argument is that Brexit changed the political conditions. It was a fundamental change in political conditions in which a new referendum is, um, well, it is justified. The tactics on Northern Ireland and Ireland, uh, I cannot tell you the extent of the anger in Ireland at this point. Um, I happen to work there uh, quite a bit. I, contacts with people in government, contacts with the business community, contacts, of course, with the academic community and with NGOs. The anger at the English tactics to try and affect to pit Northern Ireland against the Irish as the UK tries to pit itself versus the EU in this effort to remove the Northern Irish Protocol, which would de facto bring back a hard border in Ireland. And for those of you who know Irish history, including recent Irish history, the danger of a hard border is, is that all of the effort that is embodied in the Good Friday Agreement of 1998 to stabilize the island, to get out of decades of violence across all sides of the communities in the North and in the South, that work could be undone with a hard border. And the Johnson government appears not to care at all about that. In other words, the Irish are expendable and so are the Northern Irish, even the Unionist. Now, even the question of unionism in Northern Ireland is very complicated. There are now several factions of unionism, several groups of unionists in Northern Ireland. But overall, the idea is amongst the unionists that they have been left behind by London in a certain way with the customs line, whereas other members of the Northern Irish community feel they're being left behind by London now with the attempt to remove the customs line and put the hard border. In. No one feels satisfied with the, London's, with the arrangements. So the tactics, of the Johnson government, summarized by Lord Frost, 
Let me just tell you the story in just 60 seconds to tell you how this worked diplomatically or undiplomatically. Um, the Institute of, of International Economic Affairs in Dublin, again, uh, a place I value, uh, Marlo Sefcovic uh, last week went before the IIEA and said to them, okay, look, we've had months of negotiations. Uh, it has been difficult, but we've had months of negotiations. We're ready to issue a detailed compromise proposal over the question of the status, economic, political, of Northern Ireland and of Great Britain. He said, this will be revealed next week. And indeed the European Union um, unveiled the compromise on Wednesday. Before they could unveil it, however, Lord Frost, this hardline negotiator who was brought in in March, came out and immediately said, we are unlikely to accept the compromise because we want you to get rid of the European Court of Justice in terms of having any role in the Brexit agreement. So in other words, Frost issued a preemptive strike against the EU before the compromise could be rolled out and discussed. And he brought that out in comments to the English media over the weekend, and then on Tuesday in a speech in Portugal. Um, why is that significant? Because the European Union made it very clear throughout the Brexit negotiations that it would not, it would not jettison the European Court of Justice. That as a European Union, it could not enter political agreements without the guidance or at least the legal interpretation of the European Court of Justice. And now the UK is effectively saying, we get to decide what happens on the Northern Irish Great Britain question, and you have no input through the European Court of Justice. And if you demand input, we're gonna walk away from the protocol altogether. That is where we are right now. That's where the tactics are. They're covered up with a lot of bluster in the UK media, which is very dysfunctional. And I'm happy to address that with talk of sausage wars, fishing wars, with rhetoric which invokes World War II, which invokes England's 1966 World Cup win over Germany. Every anti-European trope will be rolled out, not to try to illuminate what is happening, but to deflect from what is happening. So in summary, you will hear a lot of noise which will continue from the Johnson government about how, well, let's put it this way, Boris Johnson last week spoke before the Conservative Party conference. He said nothing of substance regarding Brexit, but he kept talking about this golden age for Britain, this golden age for Britain, even as we have had a significant increase in food banks, even as we have had petrol shortages, even as we have got an unprecedented number of job vacancies because Europeans can't work here. He's talking about a glorious age for Britain, but his slogans were, and I am not making this up, build back better, which you might recognize from Joe Biden as well, build back butter, build back bitter, not bitter as I might appear to be right now, but bitter as in bitter beer, and build back badger. I swear to God, his centerpiece statement was build back badger to the conservatives. In other words, Boris Johnson is blustering. He has blustered all along. It's at the background of his own personal career. And he has staked his political personal future on that bluster, which is evasive, which is diversionary. An emperor, not just with shredded clothes, but with absolutely no substantive clothes, but is happy to be naked in policy terms if he can get away with it like the Wizard of Oz in terms of not revealing what's behind the curtain. So the bluster of the Johnson government has only compounded the consequences that we face, in my opinion, and now I'm ready for full and frank discussion in that foreign and commonwealth phrase, which means we're gonna have a bit of a verbal dust up. Thank you all so much for listening. Thank you so much, Scott. I, um, it's a, I was calling you Scott, so um, yes, please. this is conversational. Yes, yes. We will go forth Absolutely. doing so. Um, thanks for setting the tone and the, the content for what should be a great conversation. So I don't have a, a cue going just yet, but I know it will start as people mm -hmm. shift from kind of listening to thinking a little bit um, at this stage of the of the hour. Um, I I was fascinated. I mean, everything you said, I don't have anything to argue with you about, mm -hmm. but I do have things to push you on just sure, because sure. of my own my own curiosity and my own. Um, I'm just, I'm just, there are deep questions that are unanswered for me that um, I have maybe, you know, 
light insights into, but really are core puzzles still. And I think there's a lot of puzzles on the Brexit. And you you kind of pointed us in a few directions on the why. Well, you 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 actually, I'm going to push you harder on the why, okay. but you kind of, you described the how more. And I want to push harder in kind of a, you know, political science or a, you know, a social science uh, or a historical idea of like what, what were the triggers here, you know, that led a state down a path like this? And I really, I really liked, I mean, I have kind of a, like a more of a comment than a question, but it is a question, you know, but I wanted to take us back to the beginning of your talk when you were talking about some of the emotionality and the, the, the feelings involved. And that's something that, um, a lot of us, at least, I don't know if, you're, you, if your whole career has been comfortable with that, but a lot of us are uncomfortable. Those of us who have seen states as rational actors or who assess at least first states as rational actors, it brings us great discomfort to assess things as emotional. Um, it's something that in the general population, people talk about politics and foreign policy as emotional, like George Bush invaded Iraq because he was angry about his father almost getting assassinated by Saddam Hussein, which kind of seems silly. But then one of the best papers that I've seen in the last five years did talk about in a bigger picture way, the, UN, in the United States invaded Iraq um, because it was wounded ego wise from its failures of the 1990s and wanted to assert military power in some domain. And even though, you know, and that that's one of the best articles I've seen, actually, and one of the best fitting to the available evidence about why the United States did such a self um, and civilizationally, you know, defeating disastrous thing, decision, which was highly irrational, right? You know, so there's emotions there. And I thought that you did a really great job defending that and, and illustrating it. But then my comment is, is there's always emotions, right? Um, there's always irrationality. And indeed, and I don't want to sound elitist when I say this, because it's not an elitist comment, but society is irrational. You know, the markets are irrational. Um, and by irrational, I don't mean crazy. I mean, they have parochial interests, right? They have their own things. They're every, you know, if you basically you know, let things be run just by society, then they, you're never going to reach like public interest and rationality, you know, as a state and foreign policy, at least. And, um, and that is a, that, and then it's hard, it's hard for states to be rational, but they do so by building up, um, like in a Weberian sense, very good bureaucracies with merit and civil service. And, you know, they build in neutrality and laws against corruption and laws trying to, you know, keep, um, irrationality out of it. And by irrationality, you and I don't mean craziness. We mean things that are not for the public interest, right? And yeah. so um, then, so then here's my question. That was a long comment, but here's my question. Yeah. I buy it that um, a lack of rationality drove the UK into Brexit or that, you know, drove the US into the Iraq war. But what's the, what's the thing that comes before that? What's kind of the causal trigger or the thing in, you know, what would you propose or hypothesize decayed rationality. And by rationality, I mean, you know, are we talking about a decay of, you know, the public sector or bureaucracy or those things that protect rationality or the public interest? And so that's my question in this context. Yeah, that's a great question. It's in the 15th century. <laughs> well, I'll explain that in just a minute. But let me also think, because this intersects with what we've got in Q&A from Richard Rosen, which are what are the psychological reasons for supporting Brexit? Um, let me start off with the tail end of what you're saying in terms of which would be my approach to institutions and to norms, right? And that is institutions and norms, political, social, um, do not implement our emotions. Uh, they contain them or they're meant to contain them, right? The whole process of the European Union in itself as a European project in part was to try to contain the emotive within nations, within communities that had driven European to countless conflicts up into the disaster of World War II. And you all know that story quite well. Uh, the European Union, the way it has developed for all the bureaucracy for, that is there, for all the, the tangles that are there, and it can be frustrating quite so often, is in a way to contain the excesses of emotion, even to this point today, where if you all and I, if you'd like to discuss what's happening in Hungary and Poland, which is quite disturbing, about the erosion of norms and the erosion of institutions within those countries, the EU is trying to limit that damage. Um, in the United Kingdom, the whole idea that we have of the common law, the idea that we supposedly share as part of the special relationship with the way that US laws and institutions develop, was to contain emotions. Go back to the Federalist Papers, 
right? To talk about Madison's approach to it, for example. You know, uh, tyranny of the majority is not just a reference to a political approach, it's a reference to emotions as well, the emotional tyranny that takes place. So, you know, all of that's been contained in a way, what's happened is Brexit's undone that. It's undone it in the way that we have seen it being done by others as well, such as the authoritarian challenge. You can talk about Putin, you can talk about, um, for example, what I referred to earlier, which is the, uh, the authoritarian impulse in Eastern Europe. But Brexit is specifically undoing of it in a country which had prided itself in its political culture on rationality. We were not Hobbesian. We'd gotten beyond that. Now, why the 15th century? The Battle of Agincourt, 1415. We, the English, we beat the French. Um, if you don't mind me, I'm going to go on for a couple minutes about this. You all know that when you flip someone off in the United States, you do it with one finger, correct? You know, in the United, you know, in the UK, in England, when you do it, you do it with two. You flash a V at them. When the English captured French bowmen, crossbowmen, archers, they cut off their two fingers so they couldn't fire again. That is a story in English political culture which has its roots in our rivalry, our contest, our conflict with the French. Take Agincourt. And if you might remember, what is it, Henry V? The speech from Henry V, which is enshrined, of course, not just in Shakespeare, but in the film versions from Olivier de Branagh. That speech from Henry V became the cornerstone of the promotion of the national curriculum by the Thatcherite government in the 1980s. You know, we few, we band of brothers. That is a speech which is rooted in the idea of Tudor propaganda of England standing up to France. Then Tudor propaganda, we're talking about Henry VIII. We're talking about Elizabeth. Not only did we stand up to the French, we stood up to the Spanish, the Spanish Armada. And we continued to stand up to Europe through the centuries. Go to any English museum, to an extent Scotland, to an extent Northern Ireland, but especially an English museum, and you will see those centuries of conflict with Europeans, which is enshrined through paintings, which is enshrined in literature, which is enshrined in statues. Even take it to the extent of when you remember, it was Churchill's speech in 46 was not about we stand with Europe against communism. It was the Anglo-Saxon peoples stand against communism. Well, they're French, the Germans, the Belgians, the Dutch. What I'm telling you is, and this is probably something where my bias, my subjectivity comes from being an outsider who has lived in this culture and who is not completely part of it for more than 35 years. And that is, there is an English sense of rivalry of contest with Europe, which continues even as England became part of, uh, uh, sorry, the UK became part of the European Union. And remember, sorry, that is combined with a second factor. So I'm gonna go through three factors. The second factor, which was the loss of empire. When you had the loss of imperial position, which is an emotive loss, just so happens my initial academic work was on Suez. Again, another myth about loss of empire, but a very powerful myth which takes place. When you have that idea of loss of empire, it doesn't disappear. And that sense of loss of empire is here in the 21st century to the extent of that when the Johnson government is trying to justify Brexit, it returns to the idea of a global Britain. And where does it project that? Not in Europe, because we don't like the Europeans, but in the Asia Pacific region, including the agreement with Australia, uh, the nuclear subs agreement. So we want to regain an imperial position or at least a position of power, of superiority. We want to do it vis-a-vis -vis the Europeans. And then you link that up with point three, which is the specific issue of immigration as it stood in 2016. You all might remember that 2015 was like the height of the refugee movement that came out of the Syrian conflict. So 5.5 million Syrian refugees, sorry, 6.5 million Syrian refugees. Now, most of them were in neighboring countries. Most of them parked up in Turkey under an agreement with the EU but there were almost a million that got to Germany. You may remember that there were waves of migration of refugees from Libya, from North Africa, from Sudan, Somalia, Afghanistan, all through this period. And the Brexiteer movement tied itself to the idea of the immigrants will take over the United Kingdom. And they tied that to the idea, which is a bit bizarre, of you got to keep the Europeans out. Now, in fact, there has been a lot of European movement from Central and Eastern Europe to the United Kingdom. I've got a lot of friends from that area who came over here to work. 
they didn't refer in the propaganda to Central and Eastern Europe as much as the specter of those guys who came from outside of Europe, who actually weren't affected by Brexit. Their status wouldn't be affected, but they invoked it to, we have to protect ourselves with the channel from everybody moving across Europe that's going to come and invade us. And in the most notorious billboard in the 2016 referendum, Nigel Farage, uh, who was the leader of the UK Independence Party, who was then uh, becoming part of the Trump campaign, and there are links between the Trump campaign and the Brexit campaign, stood in front of a billboard where you just had a long winding line of refugees who happened not to be white. And I feel this personally because I'm an immigrant. My UK citizenship only comes through on December the 7th. So then I will no longer be an immigrant, but nobody looks at me as an immigrant because I'm white. This billboard had people of color. That's the third factor, immigration, which was a real issue in terms of housing, in terms of social services. I'm not denying that, but this was being played upon emotionally. And then the fourth factor was Boris Johnson himself. Boris Johnson, who and is on the record, tried to become a journalist, got done for plagiarism when he was at, I think, The Telegraph, who then tried his hand at writing books, who then became a politician, was a mayor of London. What is Johnson's foundational myth? He has written about Churchill. He writes about Churchill. He invokes Churchill in his own bumbling, fumbling way. He tries to play at being Churchill. And you can see where that taps into everything else surrounding the difference between us in England, not the United Kingdom in England versus them in Europe. That would be my starting point. So there are some questions um, coming in, but I want to push you harder, yeah. not yeah. aggressively harder, but I'm just okay. deeply curious into getting some of your um, more precise insights, because I love the broad, um, the broad stroke. Um, so I heard you say there's something I think that your answer is going to be, but I want to push you harder on kind of the logic, like if we're thinking about the causal chain of the logic of how we get from the 15th century to 2016. Um, loss of empire, absolutely, you know, that that is an emotive loss, but other countries lost their empire. So I'm kind of trying to push at um, what is making um, England, you know, in this emotive reaction so um, exceptional, you know, and um, so you have a loss of empire. Um, it's a, it's maybe a more recent loss of empire or more, sig more significant loss of empire than say, you know, France or Italy or other losses of empire. Um, and so you also have a lot of national founding myths in other places, especially other European countries, you know, where they have just as much um, emotive attachment to former battles or, you know, critical junctures um, or even more constructed myths, you know, that have uh, even less to do with material reality, um, you know, like poems or stories or whatever. And so to me, like if I'm going to push you harder, like if you were my graduate student and you were constructing mm -hmm. an argument here, I would say, OK, great. But then I was really honing in on maybe those are necessary conditions, you know, for this this to be flourishing and for a state to go full emotional, you know, and basically throw away its national interests and commit economic suicide, you know, in this way, or at least economic severe damage and uh, and even further damage to itself politically. Um, and then and then what I found was so interesting was um, when you said that those that the those that national cultural material was brought back. Um, in yeah. the 1980s in the form of, of um, curricular changes. And so can you speak more about what you think, like, the, you know, like hone in further? And then I wanted to ask about the immigration too, but go ahead. Because there's a big difference to get specific between the French, German, Italian path out of World War II and the UK path. So you all will remember that France and Germany and Italy come out of uh, initially uh, the Marshall Plan with the US supporting more European uh, integration or at least cooperation. The European coal and steel community between France and Germany, uh, you bring in Italy, you bring in the, uh, uh, the low countries, uh, Netherlands, Luxembourg and Belgium. And that is the European economic community which uh, formally comes into being with the Milan Agreement comes in I think, or sorry, Treaty of Rome through uh, January 1st, 1957, right? The UK was not part of that. They deliberately stood outside of the EEC. That was a decision of the conservative governments of the day. Uh, 
notably uh, Churchill government, then uh, the Eden government, and then specifically Harold Macmillan. The UK decided instead it was going to pursue the three rings concept politically and economically, which was alliance with the United States, the Commonwealth, and relations with Europe, but you're in the ring, you're, you're between the three rings, so you're outside of Europe. That meant that France, Germany, and Italy tied their economic development to the EEC, whereas the UK had not done so in the 50s. It also meant that from the 50s, you had the teaching in French, German, Italian schools, Dutch schools of a civic education, which put Europe at the center of it. The UK never went through that. When the UK belatedly went into the European Union, it was after the shock to empire, uh, the withdrawal from east of Suez, but it was also after the economic shocks where Britain went into a relative economic decline in the 60s vis-a-vis -vis Europe. So there was an economic incentive that overpowered the emotive to get in in the 70s. Now, Thatcher would still play on the emotive. Thatcher would still play on it for her own political fortune. She was extremely good at it. And so in the 1980s, you get this invocation, which still is that we still are distinct from Europe, thus the national curriculum, embodying the emotion through, the, you know, through education. A English first approach to education versus European first, but Thatcher still kept us economically and politically inside the EU and compromised quite a lot with the Europeans, more than you would think, more than she would admit to publicly before she went out in 1990. But of course, if you go into the 1990s, and I know we've only got a certain amount of time, but the seeds of what we see in Brexit in the 90s come immediately after Thatcher goes. Because as the European Union moves to the Treaty of Maastricht, you have a wing of the Conservative Party, including the Prime Minister John Major, who says, you know, we need to at least politically be part of this. Economically, we'll stay outside the Euro, which is a story I'll get into as well. But politically, we still need to be part of this. But there are conservatives like Bill Cash, who's still in Parliament today, who says, we do not want to be part of Europe. The Treaty of Maastricht is our excuse to come out of the EU entirely. David Cameron comes in to try to hold it together. Thus, the final compromise, the fatal blundering compromise, which is thinking that they will win a referendum to stay in Europe, he promises to hold one, and he miscalculates. That would be the, the immediate narrative I'd run through. And I know you had more to your question, but that's my starting point to, to come through with that. So no, I really it really helped me. Um, I mean, I, I know these facts, but the stylization of you putting together the narratives is really important in terms of our causal understanding of how um, mythology um, and emotion can then um, go from just being some raw material, you know, in, in politics to something that basically captures the national interest um, and, and takes out rationality or any, any uh, Im images of rationality. Now, again, you know, emotion is not divorced from structures or not divorced from structures and the manipulation of institutions. So when we get to that fundamental moment, in 2016, what happens is, is that Cameron has come back. I don't know if anybody remembers the specific issue that triggered the referendum. Cameron had come back at the start of 2016, and there was a big issue in the United Kingdom about whether people who came in from the European Union could have access to our public services free of cost. And Cameron came back with a compromise with the EU, which is the UK was granted by the EU a time period where these people would not be granted services. It was almost an exception within European legislation. So Cameron said, look, I'm bringing back this compromise and his own party, people within his own party said, that's, that's not enough. That's not enough. You know, we still don't think these people should claim on public services. Uh, again, that's bound up with the whole thing around immigration, mm -hmm. but it's also bound up with the fact that the UK, like many parts of the world, is in economic recession and has been since 2010. And we've got an austerity government. Mm -hmm. So we've got pressures on housing, we've got pressures on healthcare, we've got pressures on education, as well as we've got a downturn in the jobs market. That wing of the Conservative Party, which had been itching to come out of the EU since the 1990s, sees its opportunity. And you have individuals who see their opportunity. Boris Johnson told people from the time that he was in secondary school that one day he would be king not prime minister king now i don't think that story is completely uh exaggerated that's at the heart of johnson and johnson comes in 
to say, I'm going to lead this movement. This diehard mayor of London, who was a conservative, Michael Gove, the same way he was from in the conservative ranks, they had personal ambition that they thought could be fulfilled, not necessarily by winning the Brexit referendum, but by losing it narrowly, because then they can get rid of Cameron. Their miscalculation was <laughs> they actually won. That is, by the way, why Boris Johnson did not become prime minister in 2016, because he didn't know how to handle it, the fact that they had won. So he has to wait another three years before he makes this move. There's that just that jumble of economics and party manipulation in an English sense. We could tell the same story in Scotland in a very different way because the institutions and structures have become devolved and because the personalities are different, notably Nicola Sturgeon, who's a much different politician, which is why I think, yeah, I'll put my money on it. I think Scotland becomes independent within the next decade. Fascinating. So you, when you were talking, though, it really reminded me of, um, I'm going to pivot to the two questions I see um, for the last 20 minutes or the last 15 minutes, because I just going to push you um, for a couple more minutes, like three or four more minutes on, um, I think that if what am I taking away from what you said, you know, in that kind of critical juncture is mid-century, 20th century um, economic decline, of empire in the 50s, 60s, and 70s without the um, economic boom that takes off in the continent. Um, and also, I mean, we have to remind ourselves that um, um, Britain was the first recipient state and was the reason for the creation of the Bretton Woods, Inst Woods institutions. Like the first IMF loans were to the developing state of you know economically depressed um, Great Britain. Um, and so that's a that's a huge hit. It's a double whammy, right? To be an economically developing state that's sinking further. The reason why the emotive could rise back in the UK was a combination of the immediate, of austerity, but based upon the fact that in the decades before that, there had been relative growth. Being part of the European Union had been good for Great Britain, right. as it was for many states. But you have the growth, which then has the shock of austerity on top of it, and that creates the backlash, the wave against where we had gone from the 1970s to go into that. So my last question then, and we, before I um, open the floor to the, um, the um, audience questions, my last question is about the, um, the racialization of the distinction between or the conflation of migrants. Um, you know, the, 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 U, the UK absorbed many, um, you know, intra-EU migrants that was, good for, that was good for its labor markets, good for science, good for medicine, you know, health, all these things. Um, especially from Central and Eastern Europe. And there was there was some discourse, you know, about like Polish plumbers and things like that taking jobs initially, but it wasn't racialized, you know, um, and it wasn't as maybe intense and I, or as emotional, um, or that's my, that's my question. And then you had, you know, waves of refugees. Um, and also you had those who were, you know, had access to, um, you know, to the UK because of former empire or who were there because of former empire that are not, that have nothing to do with former with waves of refugees. And so um, it was really interesting to me when you heard people say the threat of refugees is why we want to leave the EU when actually legally and logically, because um, the UK was part of the EU during waves of refugees. It was protected from refugees by the flawed Dublin conventions, which meant it could send refugees back to um, the places where they landed. And if they left the EU, they no longer can send refugees back to, well, at least, you know, like at the, you know, the logic is there's no mechanism for sending refugees back. It actually removes a layer of protection from refugees to leave the EU. And no, no one, but, the, the, but there's emotion and there's race there. And I don't know if you want to add to your comment yeah. about that. There's no logic there though. And the yeah. point is we thrive on the fact as academics that we try to bring logic into politics in terms of our comprehension and so on. But we're bringing logic into which people sometimes deliberately, sometimes just because of emotion are bringing illogic into it. The, the facts are that European migration, intra-EU migration, migration has been beneficial to the UK on almost any study you can talk about. It's actually contributed to UK growth. There is a cost, but a cost which you're willing to you know, hopefully accept of migration from outside the UK, including refugees. But Nigel Farage, 
who was the driving public face of Brexit, even though he couldn't get into political power because of it, as well as others like Johnson, they couldn't admit that. They could not admit that because if they said that the EU migrants were a benefit to the United Kingdom, their whole rationale for Brexit collapses. So how are they going to get around that? You go not with logic, but you go with the emotive of them versus us. And the easiest way to represent them versus us is, and there was some animosity against the polls. I need to be completely frank about this. There were, for example, attacks on polls down in London or in the London area because they got caught up in this. But quite a lot of the rhetoric of Brexit was very much about the migrants and the refugees who were of different colors who would cross the English Channel. Now, here's the paradox. You're absolutely right. The effect of Brexit is, is not that the Europe, is not that Britain can control its borders. It doesn't have an arrangement to control its borders effectively now. So we're at the point now with the Home Secretary, Priti Patel, who is Indian. So this is a paradox. She's made her career within the conservative as, a, as an immigrant, as a child of immigrants, Indian immigrants, but she's the hard lines home secretary. We will send refugees or migrants back to France by intercepting boats in the channel. No, you won't, because that's against international law. You can't do that. We will send refugees or asylum seekers. We'll send them to a sentient island in the South Pacific, which was last in the news in 1982, because it was the staging area to then go to the Falkland Islands to whip the Argentines. No, you're not gonna send them to a sentient island because it's not viable. But that's the kind of ridiculous stuff we're now getting resorted to because there is no easy answer to immigration. But what the Brexiteers did through the illogic was, here's your easy answer to immigration. Give us independence. Those aren't my words, by the way. Those are the words of Nigel Farage, who on that night of June 23rd, 2016, and this ticked me off as an American said, this is our Independence Day. I mean, look, it's one thing to have Brexit go through, but then you stole American Independence Day for your you know, ridiculous political project, you puffed up buffoon. Sorry, that's probably not very academic language. So Scott, you saw, I think, I think you'd address Richard's, uh, Richard Rosen's question about the psychological yeah, reasons yeah. for supporting Brexit, but then there's a kind of another nuanced uh, prediction question or asking you about how you think the population or what you think the implications are going to be from the now material, significant material decline that is inevitable essentially structurally with Brexit. On, and on the, this, what do you anticipate? Yeah, the reaction I the mean, population will be to just to that? Again, there's a logical answer here, project reality, if you will, which is that there is a possible, if not a win-win, it's a win and a mitigation of loss, which is for the UK to go into the single market. I mean, it's just there. It is obviously there. If the UK is part of the European single market, then you immediately remove the problem between Northern Ireland and Great Britain. You... Uh, give a boost back or a recovery back to economic uh, trade, to movement of services. And the UK has suffered in terms of services as well, which matters a lot given the financial hub of London. You immediately, coming back into the single market, have those links rebuilt between businesses who operate transnationally. I can go on and on, but emotionally, the single market is ruled out. That means we are in we're in a cul-de-sac, a dead end, which is there is no economic way out of Brexit, which is immediate. Now, what the Johnson government will say initially is we're going to get the trade deals. We're going to get the, we're going to get the trade. Deal. And they said for a long time, we're going to get the trade deal with the United States. Now, they have stopped saying that because the Biden administration finally told them no, because until you deal with the Irish issue, there is no chance that Congress is going to endorse a trade deal, even after the years that it takes to confirm it. Something I've written about extensively for years, which is that Ireland was a barrier to any UK-US trade deal. They have talked about trade deals with Asia Pacific region. They've talked about it with Saudi Arabia. They've talked about it with India. The only trade deal they have got so far is a minor modification of the trade deal with Japan. They have renewed trade deals that already existed, and they will dress them up as being successes. But the only trade deal is with Japan. The, they have a trade deal in principle with Australia, but that immediately has run into problems because that's not necessarily a win-win because it's going to hit UK farmers. So the Johnson government's rationale, which was we simply will have trade deals that make us global Britain, doesn't hold up. So what happens is, is that we get distraction and diversion. And the latest distraction and diversion which we get is 
that Boris Johnson has actually said that, and I'll, this actually refers to a question about the truck drivers, which I'll clarify in just a minute, is that the damage that we have to supply lines, the damages that we have to disruptions of goods, uh, the damages we have to the labor force in the United Kingdom right now is not because of Brexit, it's because we are a high wage economy versus the low wage economies in Europe. Well, I got a newsflash for Boris Johnson. German wages are higher than they are in the UK across the board. So that one doesn't hold up either. But that's the type of deception and illogic that they throw at us. Because I'm just going to be honest with you folks. I Logically, I think we hit breaking point. I think we hit breaking point economically. But the government will try to cover that up by, in effect, calling upon us in the spirit of the nation to sacrifice. And I don't, I don't know when this hits the crunch, but that may be why I'm making plans to relocate to Ireland. So there you go. Do you want to pivot to, um, you have a choice. There are two more questions. One is to clarify the, um, I think it's about the truck drivers. Um, Greta's question about the truck drivers, about the displacement of, um, I think LTV maybe, unless I'm getting the, the acronym. Yeah, or HDV as we refer to it here. Um, yeah. Um, and then, vehicles. okay. And then there is a question. I'll just read you. I'll just say all the questions. I've got them. Kind of, I've got okay, them great. Here. Fantastic. We're good. So we've got, one, we've, got a, we've got a specific on the supply lines. We have got a question going back to what we've been talking about, uh, about those who voted for Brexit being non-credentialed. Um, a more general question I'll pick up. And then we've got a question about Northern Ireland. Uh, about the relationship UK and Ireland EU. I'm going to go uh, the supply lines issue, the truck drivers issue, then Northern Ireland Catholics, and then the broad one to, since we were supposed to talk about the US and the UK, to link those two, uh, to link our two together by talking about uh, who supported Brexit and who supported Trump. Um, the, sorry, the point I wasn't being entirely clear about. Uh, the, the nature of the European Union transport and goods market is that it wasn't just UK truck drivers in the UK, it wasn't just French truck drivers in France, German truck drivers in Germany. By the nature of those of you who know the United States well, well, truck drivers drive long distances for transport, and that is true also in Europe, even when you have to cross the, uh, the channel to get from the EU to the UK, or the Irish Sea to get from Ireland to, the UK, uh, to Great Britain. And um, what happened is that when the UK went into Brexit, the arrangement for those truck drivers to move from Europe to the UK were effectively suspended. So without a very cumbersome uh, bureaucratic procedure to in fact get a work visa, we no longer could get European truck drivers that could move goods in the UK. They had to stop effectively at the port of Calais in France put the goods on a ferry, and then you have to find a UK truck driver, a British truck driver, to bring them out there. And we don't have enough UK truck drivers to do that. And anybody should have known this because Brexit was years in the making. It was years in confirming it. But for some reason, the government didn't plan for this. And so what happened is that through the course of this year, we've had a buildup where goods have not been getting delivered or delayed. And we finally hit us this autumn and it became symbolized by the petrol crisis. We didn't have enough people to move petrol, gasoline around. Um, that's been alleviated to an extent through certain arrangements which have been made, but it is affecting other goods besides gasoline seriously, including shortages of food and heaven help us, Christmas toys. So our headlines this week is we won't get toys for the kids if we don't order them by like the end of October. Um, the second question, which is on Northern Ireland to build about what we're talking, uh, the, the growing Catholic population in Northern Ireland is indeed something to be recognized, but I think the overall story of Northern Ireland has not been that the growing Catholic population means that there's a natural move to unification of the North and of the Republic. Instead, the story since the Good Friday Agreement since 1998 has been of the change in the Northern Irish parties in terms of power sharing, building a democracy. So you have, for example, not only the unionist parties, such as the Democratic Unionist Party, uh, and now the new unionist party, which is challenging it, but you have Sinn Féin, which was the political branch of the Irish Republican Army, now mainstream political party, nonviolent, and they share power in Belfast. And that actually has been a relative success 
There's a lot of complications in Northern Ireland, but a relative success for almost 25 years. And the problem here is, is that Brexit destabilizes that by the risk that it raises animosity within Northern Ireland between the communities over economic and social issues. Um, we had reached what in effect was a condominium relationship with both Ireland and Great Britain having a stake in Northern Ireland and Britain has unsettled that. Um, that, that I think is, is more important than any specific demographic graphic change, at least in the short term. And then the big one, it is really easy. And it, God knows it's been easy for the past five years. And I say this as the son of Trumpist, my father and my mother, God bless them, who I saw for the first time in two years, two weeks ago. Um, I am the brother of uh, a sister who's a diehard evangel uh, evan post-millennial evangelical and a diehard Trumpist and as the brother of someone who is a never Trump or Republican. It would be very easy for me to look back on that and say, look, Trump's victory and the result of Brexit was clearly those who simply just, they didn't have a higher education level. They didn't have a higher economic level. They didn't have a higher social. First of all, I don't think that's a constructive way to approach it. Secondly, it's not true. In Brexit, there was a significant vote across the board, across all age groups, which led to the narrow majority for Brexit. If there was a difference, it wasn't between educated, non-educated, it wasn't between you know, A, B, C, D, E, the economic classes, it was geographic. So England had a much higher vote for Brexit than Scotland did. Scotland actually voted to remain. Northern Ireland was almost evenly split. I think it might've been a slight remain vote, I'll have to check. And Wales was a, a, a narrow vote to leave. So it was geography that made more of a difference as well as age differentiation. Younger voters were more likely to stay in the European Union, but they didn't turn out, which is a story that we can go into at some point, why they didn't turn out, I think in a sense, because Remainers were complacent about that, too complacent. Similarly with Trump, um, Look, uh, I'll have to go back and look at it, but white college educated women, if I remember correctly, was a narrow majority for Trump in 2016. Uh, so university education did not explain why Trump won. And I'll just give you a personal story, which is why I, I kick against the non-credentialed argument. Um, why did my mother support Donald Trump? Not because, and she's, she's got a master's degree, highly successful professional, for more than 50 years. Why did she and all her friends who were in their 70s and 80s support Trump? Because they could not stand Hillary Clinton. Could not stand Hillary Clinton. There was a gender dynamic amongst older women in my experience, which was that an alpha woman rankled them the wrong way. As well as for the fact that you had 30 years of basically anti-Clinton stuff on attack radio and TV, but we can talk about that the next time you let me cross your path. Thank you so much, Scott. This was fantastic. And what a great narrative um, imagery about the emotions and about, about uh, such a fantastic conversation capturing some very big aspects that we haven't yet talked about in all the ways we've talked about this from all these dimensions um, in our series. So thank you so much for your contribution. And thank you so much for letting me be here in the week that we finally get back to the World Series. <laughs>